I decided to tell this story from the point of view of a funeral urn that I imagined that Mom would have purchased in a very small cramped shop in Chinatown. Mom had a great love of antiquities. There's something about this funeral urn that really speaks to him. So he picks it up and he doesn't realize he thinks it's a vase. I place this funeral urn in Mom's writing room. So he sits opposite Mom. He watches characters that just appear behind Mom that Mom can't see, but the urn can that he sees them whispering their stories into Mom's ears. There's a lot of pictures of Mom. He was photographed a lot and he was filmed a lot. And I've always searched for like an urn or something like that, but I haven't seen it. But I just thought this is something that Mom would have done. I've had an obsession with Mom and his work probably for about 15 years. When I was in Singapore, I think I probably had an afternoon off and I sat in the cafe just on the bottom of the National Library in Singapore, which is gorgeous, really beautiful. And I sat there and I actually wrote it all in one sitting. Obviously I amended and I edited and everything, but no, I was just really inspired and I just thought there was something so lovely about him buying things and using them and taking them home. It was just one of those stories that just kind of took on its own life. And I have written other short stories about Mom um, that are just sitting there really doing nothing because I am quite inspired by him and his life. And then I saw the opportunity for the Best Asian Short Story Anthology competition and I entered. I was very pleased that they chose my story. I was very pleased that Mom still has some relevance today within Southeast Asia. Right now I'm working on a documentary about Mom in Southeast Asia, about his travels. He took two trips over there um, during the 1920s with his partner, Gerald Haxton. Um, I'm actually looking at what inspired Maugham um, and what he wrote about and his legacy. Willie's Chinese Funeral Urn. On entering the small cramped shop in Chinatown, Willie had appeared like a stream of golden light highlighting the dust of our past. His suit and hat pale, his shoes polished to a high shine, Vibrations of excitement quickly circled, not just from us, but my old owner. Typically bent over like a fallen tree, he now stood tall, his toothless grin widening at Willie's appreciation for his things. My old owner followed him around the crowded shop. Pointing and speaking in his native language, Willie didn't understand any of it, but smiled graciously. We all watched, waiting. Some of the dark horseshoe chairs felt his fingerprints rub against them, and the walnut console table felt his hand as he leaned down to see underneath. It struck me as odd that a man such as this would enter alone. Usually Westerners came in with a local guide, a man they thought would help them haggle, when in reality he was working on a commission with the old owner. But Willie was different. He walked around as if he was a king, eyeing us up. We were like the girls upstairs, standing in line, waiting to be chosen to provide amusement, stimulation, and maybe even love if the right man walked in. In his pale suit, he stopped and admired a screen. She was the real beauty of the shop. Her carvings of dragons and birds dated back to the 17th century. She had only arrived last week, and the old owner had positioned her in the middle of the small shop. The screen had not uttered a word since her arrival. She only emitted sounds of weeping in the later hours, and the silver mirror had told her to be quiet, that she was upsetting the young barrel stools. Willie studied her, and most of us agreed that it was a done deal. He would take her. But then he shook his head. The old owner, not understanding, said, You buy, yes, sir. No, Willie said, his voice soft. No, no thank you. He sighed deeply, and I remember, as he appeared to glance around for one last time, he then saw me by the door. I was filled with mid-19th century fabric parasols, lovely ladies that were once used by nobility and were now scrunched tightly in me, their beautiful tassels discolored, folded away. The old owner had assumed that Willie had wanted to see the parasols. Yes, sir, he said, rushing past him. You see, very nice royalty. He took one of the girls out and opened her up, and her thick, dusty, ornate 
fabric laced with gold shone in the dark shop as if she was a small moon. We were all too busy watching her ivory handle spin to notice that Willie was staring at me. It was only when he knelt and took me in his hands that I realised. I stared at him, his face brown, lines running across his forehead, his cheeks large, drooping, almost as if his face had too much skin. His lips were small, with a thin moustache laying above them, but his eyes, they were dark, inquisitive and alive. I felt a slight graze from the ring on his little finger. He lifted the parasols out of me and tipped me over. My lid set underneath. Small Chinese letters were on my bottom, but they gave no real sign of what or who I was. The old woman who had painted me had played a trick. How much? he asked. The old owner laughed. Five dollars. Willie then laughed. No, not five dollar. How much? No, sir. Five dollar. No, it isn't that valuable. How much? Sir, the screen. I don't need another screen. I bought one in Shanghai. Ah, oh, but this one, sir. Malayan. I don't want the screen, Willie sighed. I was still in his hands and they felt warm against my porcelain shell. Four dollar. No, Willie sighed, his voice raised. I give you one dollar and that is plenty for this. He handed one dollar over and the old man, surprised, took it. Okay, I rap. Willie stood with me and lifted me higher so he could examine my markings. You are a beauty, he whispered. Mm -hmm.